Honored graduates, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a very special person in American, Koki Roberts. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations. That's the main event today. Um, it is great to be home. Thank you for bringing me home. I did tell my grandchildren that I was coming uh, to LSU and uh, one of the 11 year olds said, because they're twins there too, um, one of the 11 year olds said, so are you going to meet the Mad Hatter? <laughs> and I thought he was totally confused. You know, I mean, what did LSU have to do with Alice in Wonderland? Maybe there was some Mardi Gras connection I wasn't getting, all of that. He then explained to me who the Mad Hatter was and proceeded to name by name the nine members of the team that had been picked in the NFL draft. So um, it goes far and wide, uh, the, the fame of this great school. Now, I know it drives some people here crazy that you say LSU and you think football, uh, but it is a great team. And, um, and it is... And it is a great pageant of the team and the band and, yes, some of you in tailgating. And, um, and, um, and I know the baseball team's doing very well, too. But um, I sat, I must tell you, during the presidential primary in New Hampshire in 2012, alone in my hotel room, and it's a good thing I was alone, um, watching that Alabama game. <laughs> no. It wasn't good. My friends Donna Brazil and Mary Madeline actually hopped on a plane from New Hampshire and came down to watch the game. So you see, LSU can bring Democrats and Republicans together. <laughs> um, it is a great institution in the way that it does that. And the truth is, it is a great institution. Uh, you are so privileged to be graduating from this place. It is one of the very few land and sea grant colleges in the country. It is a research in a university that is right at the cutting edge of a great deal of very important research, particularly in efforts uh, to create drug treatments to uh, treat dire diseases, and, and right at the forefront of saving our incredibly valuable coastline uh, at the very impressive Coastal Studies Institute. And it's the number one school of landscaping architecture in the country. And go for it. And, um, and dear to my heart, you have the Center for Community Engagement, Learning, and Leadership, which was recognized by the Corporation for National and Community Service uh, for its support for volunteerism and civic engagement. Yes. So many of these strides, I know, have happened under the leadership of interim president and chancellor Jenkins. As far as I can tell, he's permanent president and chancellor Jenkins. I suspect he'll be back again, and, um, and that will be a good thing. Um, you know, actually having somebody in veterinary medicine take care of college students makes a lot of sense. And um, <laughs> among President Jenkins' many, many accomplishments, Dr. Jenkins' many accomplishments, is, uh, is that not only this year is LSU got its greatest enrollment ever, but much more important for those of us in our state, it has the highest enrollment of African Americans and Hispanics ever. And that is very, very important because we want to make sure that all of our citizens get this very fine education. Education that turns out incredibly talented alums like General Jasper Welch, who says he tried to help, he helped enormously. He has served this country and this institution incredibly and valiantly over many decades. So that is the kind of graduate that we have here at LSU. So the truth is I'm really happy to talk about non-football LSU because I spent my childhood going to LSU Tulane games. They were not happy events for me uh, as the child of loyal Tulane and Newcomb alums. And uh, I was always rooting for the losing side. I um, discovered in doing research for this talk that the first football game that LSU ever played was 120 years ago against Tulane. 
and Tulane shut LSU out and apparently dominated the rivalry for the next 40 years. That was before me. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, that annual event was a huge event in our lives, and I gather there might be another game this year. Um, and, uh, but it's just, but of course, it was just one of the many, many ties uh, that uh, I had to LSU, as anybody who grows up in this state does. Uh, we all have, if not ourselves here, family, friends, relatives uh, who are here. When my parents uh, were in college, Huey Long was governor, and he expelled the editors of the Revelry uh, for being critical. So you see, it's nothing new under the sun uh, here, and I have to tell you, the Revelry uh, was cited by the Society for Professional Journalists as the number one daily newspaper, college newspaper in the country this year. So. But when the, the editors of, of Yore, under Huey, were expelled, uh, my parents, who were both editors at the Hullabaloo at Tulane, my father was editor-in-chief and my mother was the women's editor, um, they invited in those uh, rebellious revelry people, and they came to Tulane, worked on the Hullabaloo, and were friends for life. And in fact, because, because of those experiences and many others, they all went into politics together. And uh, in fact, my parents started their political lives uh, as opponents of Huey Long's corrupt successors. My parents were an oxymoron. They were Louisiana reform politicians. Doesn't happen often, but every so often. My father's first campaign in 1940 as campaign manager was Dave McGuire, one of the Revelry Seven. So the, the, it goes back many, many years. Have you, as you heard from President Jenkins, my father then served for 30 years as congressman from New Orleans and surrounding parishes initially, went on to become majority leader of the House and then was lost in an airplane accident over Alaska. And my mother, Lindy Boggs, then ran and served for nine terms. And in those positions, they were able to do a great deal for this state. And they were able to do a great deal for the nation. Uh, my father is a deep southerner leading the civil rights charge. My mother is a nice southern lady leading the fight for women's rights. And so it is uh, with their example that I want to talk to you today. I will tell you that my mother then uh, retired finally and uh, then discovered retirement was incredibly hard work. So in 1997, at the age of 81, she took a new job in a new country as the United States Ambassador to the Vatican. And we all thought, great, you know, this is going to be wonderful. It's a great uh, capstone to a career in public service. She gets to serve her country and her church. And we get to go to Rome all the time, and that's a good thing. Um, but then what happened in this country happened. And Mama found herself representing Bill Clinton to the Pope. Now think of it. Um, it was the toughest job in the diplomatic service. But um, if anybody could do it, Mama could. And... Um, she then came home to New Orleans to her house on Bourbon Street. And I mean on Bourbon Street, right smack dab in the middle of all the honky tonk on Bourbon Street. If you've been to Bourbon Street, you've been to Mama's house. Uh, in fact, when my children were small and would walk past the strippers and the other neighbors, I'd say, you know, through the woods and over the hills to grandmother's house we go. And um, then she moved from Bourbon Street to the Vatican and um, I, I teased her that the costumes hadn't changed. It was, it was still guys in dresses. And, um, and actually, I was just back for the election of the Pope, and I just kept getting the giggles thinking about that. I'm happy to tell you that Mama is alive and well at 97 and uh, is very jealous that I'm here and she's not. Uh, she grew up in Point Capi, just a few miles up the road, where I spent a huge amount of my growing up years, 
And it was so comforting this morning to listen to the weather and hear the names of all these towns that were my stomping grounds as a kid, New Roads and Donaldsonville and St. Francisville. It really made me incredibly homesick. Uh, we got here as a family in the first place because the first governor of Louisiana, William Charles Cole Claiborne, was an ancestor. So our connections go way back. But I want to tell you how he got here because it is a straight political deal. And just in case you think that politics was somehow ele more elevated or different at the time of our founding fathers, it wasn't. And um, what happened was, as some of you might remember, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr tied. Uh, you know, the people thought that they were electing one president and one vice president, but they tied and the election had to go to the House of Representatives where it took 36 ballots over several days to elect Jefferson. And this ancestor, William Charles Cole Claiborne, a very young man from Tennessee, the sole congressman from Tennessee. And when an election goes to the House of Representatives, every state has an equal number of votes. So he had as many votes as all of Virginia and all of Massachusetts. And so he was wooed heavily. And it was believed that he could be turned because he was young and vain and that if, if people just appealed to his vanity, he would go against Jefferson. But he held in on 36 ballots and um, the next month after Jefferson was elected, he appointed Claiborne governor of the Mississippi Territory straight political payoff. And, um, and then uh, when Louisiana is purchased uh, a couple of years later, he rushes down from Natchez uh, to claim the Louisiana Territory for the United States of America. So that's how we got here. Um, I think it's important to, to think about our founders in these ways because, um, you know, I write, I write history books and I write history books about women of the founding era, and um, I read their letters. It's okay now, they're dead. And, um, but when you read the letters of the wives of the founding fathers, you can be sure that they did not see them as some sort of demigods. They saw them as their husbands, and uh, flesh and blood and very real human beings. And of course, I think that that's what makes, that makes what they did far more extraordinary because it's easy for a demigod, some marble or bronze statue to do something extraordinary, but it is not easy for a flesh and blood person to do something remarkable. But that is what happened in the founding period of our country. And, uh, and the politics were tough. And a few years after that bold decision to purchase parts of what are now 13 states called the Louisiana Purchase. Jefferson wrote a letter that was somewhat fretful and accusatory to a friend who was retiring from Congress. And he said, I will not say that this time more than all others calls for the service of every man, but I will say that there never was a time when the services of those who possess talents, integrity, firmness, and sound judgment were more wanted in Congress. Sound familiar? I would, of course, put in man and woman. This happened two years after his own vice president, Aaron Burr, had murdered his political enemy. Think of it, the sitting vice president of the United States murdered Alexander Hamilton over political speech. Our most recent vice president had a problem with a gun, but as far as I know, it wasn't over that. But uh, the um, you know, so people ask me all the time, is this the most partisan time ever? No, it's not. They're not shooting each other. That's an improvement. And, um, and metal, metal detectors are good. Um, but the truth is the 1850s were the most partisan time ever. Uh, and it was a time that culminated in civil war. And obviously we do not want to repeat that. The man, in fact, who was head of the institution that was the precursor to LSU, uh, the Louisiana uh, Seminary, Seminary of Learning, um, which was in Pineville, the man who was head of that had to leave to fight the Civil War. That man's name was William Tecumseh Sherman. 
The next time he came south, it wasn't so pleasant for us. Uh, so it was uh, a terrible, terrible time that partisanship brought to a horrible head. And night, right now, we are living through a bad time. It's not as bad as that, but it is a bad time. And it is a time when we need the services of talented people, of people like you, who are graduating from this fine institution. And we need you to lead the way. We need you to consider using your very valuable education for public service, including elective office. We need you to help fix what's broken. I understand why people don't jump at the chance to go into politics. Politicians don't cover themselves with glory. Louisiana has been somewhat famous for that, but we've gotten better of late. Um, but you can't paint with one brush the few, uh, and you can't expect things to get any better if good people don't participate. First, in a very basic sense, participate by voting. And I certainly hope every single solitary one of you is registered to vote. But it is also true that you need to run. You know, we as a society have made it tough for good people to go into public office, and there's lots of blame to go around. Uh, we in the media constantly run down politicians, and we give our microphones to the shrillest voices, not those who are trying to get something done. So we bear a lot of the responsibility. You also bear some of the responsibility, because you can't have good leaders without good followers. You can't punish people. The minute you think they've done something that doesn't benefit you personally, or the minute you might disagree with them on something. In a country this big and this diverse, it can't be my way or the highway. You have to be willing to listen. Politicians themselves also bear a great deal of the responsibility for the public's perception. They run against the institutions where they serve, insisting they're not professionals, they're not professional politicians, they're amateurs. Well, I would argue that to denigrate the professional is to denigrate the profession. Would you engineering graduates argue, hire me, I'm an amateur? Uh, the same goes for all of you. You've worked hard in science and veterinary medicine, art and design and agriculture in the fabulous School of Mass Communications where I spent the morning. You've worked hard to earn professionalism, to show professionalism, and you respect the professions you have chosen. Saying only non-professionals should be governing us is to show a basic disrespect for government, and I know that that is popular but it's also dangerous. Nothing binds us together as a nation. Nothing does except our government. We have no common ethnicity, no common religion, race, or even language. Look at the rest of the world and see how easy it is to let those differences create havoc. How often are the battles being fought about ethnic differences, where struggles for power between sex of di different sects of a religion is happening in Syria right now. Only once did we let that happen here in that great tragedy of the Civil War, and we came out of it as a nation agreeing to greater political participation for more of our citizens. People who came to this country from the beginning have understood that America is an idea. That's what it is. That's what forms our nationhood, is the idea of America. And that great idea is codified in the Constitution. And that's why respect for that Constitution and the institutions it created are so important, is, is so important. Respect for all three branches, for the executive, the judiciary, and the first branch, Congress, which was designed to bring us together. That's what the word means. Congress means bring us together. And as a country, we need you bright graduates to remind the Congress that that is its job, to bring us together. Even more, 
We need you, especially you women, to get in there and do it. To serve this country that's given you so much opportunity that people around the world are lining up to risk their lives sometimes to get in. Now, I know that you will serve all of you in one way or another. Today's graduates include newly commissioned officers who could be called upon to render the ultimate service. And there are many kinds of service. Those of you in art and design will enrich our lives. Those in music and dramatic arts will enliven our lives. Those in, uh, in sciences and engineering will enhance our lives. Those in humanities and social sciences will examine our lives. Those in human science and education will edify our lives. Those in mass communication will inform our lives. Those in agriculture and coast environment will improve our lives. And those in business will enable our lives. And those in veterinary medicine will do all of those things for the other creatures who share this planet. So you will all serve and you will do it well with the great preparation you have been afforded at this superb university. But as you go forward, please consider the special place of public service in the history of this nation and make some history yourselves. Congratulations. <laughs>